Good evening, everyone, and thank you for tuning in and joining us tonight. My name is Steve Jamraz. I'm the Director of Marketing here at DAN, and we welcome you to our September webinar. This event marks the 19th time, the 19th time we've come together over the last year and a half to talk about important topics in dive safety. Tonight's presentation is about peer pressure in diving, and our presenters are Dr. Fraka Tillmans and Katherine Harris. Dr. Tillmans is the research director here at DAN. She has a PhD in human biology. She's an experienced public safety diver, scientific diver, and dive safety officer. Catherine's an open water scuba instructor, former scientific diver, and the dive accident and injury monitor here at DAN. But before we get started uh, with tonight's webinar, just a couple housekeeping items. If you're watching tonight for the first time, this presentation will last about 30 minutes we'll follow it up with a question and answer session at the end. Keep your, your questions coming, put them in the chat box, answer those for you. This webinar will also be recorded so you can watch it over on Dan's YouTube channel on your own schedule. But if you're watching tonight on the event page on dan.org, keep in mind you won't be able to ask questions there. We'll have to click on over to our YouTube channel, put the questions in the box, handle those at the end. On behalf of the entire Dan team, before we get started, I'd like to thank you for your continued of Dan. It's through your membership and trust in our dive accident insurance programs, travel insurance, and others that events like this are even possible. And we thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Frauke and Kat. Thank you, Steve. Thanks. So today we're going to talk about peer pressure in diving and how friends and your dive buddies influence your decisions. Um, what is going to happen here is we're going to talk about what peer pressure is, how that can affect you negative or positive, the best case, and um, we want to get across um, how to, to make a culture of diving safety. So what is peer pressure? If you Google that, there are a lot of definitions that are out there, but um, essentially it is the social pressure by members of one's peer group to take an action or adopt, a certain, adopt certain values or otherwise conform in order to be accepted in the group. And who inflicts this peer pressure on others? Well, basically everyone. So the players in this game are your family and friends. Um, that starts early in, in childhood with kids pressuring other kids into um, starting to smoke cigarettes, but then this also is a big topic in diving, and your dive buddies, the dive professionals, are the ones that are going to um, influence you in your decision making. And then there is, there are all of these people also on social media. So social media is one of the, the big pressures or big triggers that we have on top of this. Um, and probably one of the biggest factors is yourself because a lot of divers are very, um, very strict with themselves, uh, put themselves under a lot of pressure. And it is uh, really a question of what you perceive as your peer pressure on how you react to that. So what would family, friends, and dive buddies say? Um, a lot of, if you instructors are out there, you've probably heard the, uh, or you had the, the spouse of someone, um, who really wanted or did not want to learn to dive. And uh, that would start with the, honey, we should, you should really learn to dive because then we can share a hobby and we can go on vacation together. And um, if the spouse is afraid of water or just really doesn't, did never have an interest in diving, then this can, um, can lead to um, horrible scenarios if it goes really wrong. Um, then what would dive buddies say? Something like, we've driven this far to do this dive, why do you call it now? Or, oh no, you don't have to call the dive, you'll be fine, I'll watch out for you. Or, um, I've done this dive hundreds of times, you will be fine, there's no issue um, going into this deep water that has exactly no visibility. Um, or, the other way, you just arrived at the liverboard and, um, or at the resort and your, your buddy says, well, let's have a, a couple more drinks. The boat won't leave until eight o'clock in the morning. So all of these are pressuring, all these, these statements are pressuring you into doing something you maybe don't want to do. Um, 
we're going into a few cases here. So we're going during this webinar, we're going to discuss a few cases. And number one is going beyond one's training level. And we see this a lot. We have a lot of incidents coming into our system. Um, in this case, it was a buddy team that was diving an open water area uh, close to a cave site. And they had not discussed to go into the cave or the cavern area. But it just so happened that diver A decided to venture into that cavern. Diver B was hesitant at first, um, but didn't want to stay behind or didn't want to leave his, um, his buddy behind. So they both went into the cavern. Diver A started to silt out the cavern area, which complicated navigation for both divers, and they both became disoriented. Um, in this event, they eventually found their way out um, with 200 PSI left in their tank, which just a little bit longer in this, uh, in this scenario could have become a fatal incident. So knowing this, um, this is not the only case where this happened. Um, going beyond your training level is something that is sometimes even expected of you on a, on a, a charter. Oh, you'll be fine. 100 feet in f foot in this conditions is really not different than 70 feet, is something you might hear. Or, oh, no, you can go in that rack. I'll be right behind you. No worries. Or, hey, Cat, here, you'll need a light. It's going to be dark down there. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we hear those often between our dive buddies, but we'll also sometimes hear a little bit of pressure from the professionals on our, on our charters as well. Um, so you might hear your dive master or the dive professional say, visibility is not that bad today, or that's totally normal for the type of body of water we're diving in. Or you might hear them say, even our open water students dive in this swell. Um, if you start to sound a little nervous, they might encourage you to go anyway. Um, let's say you're having issues on descent and they'll say your weights are fine, you don't need more. So these are all things that you might hear if you're on the boat getting prepared for a dive, on the shore getting prepared for a dive, or in the car getting prepared for a dive and things like that. Um, so one case that leads as example here is um, a diver surfaced after a rapid ascent with blood in their ear. They were on a liveaboard charter. Uh, they dove a little deeper than they intended to. And when they surfaced, they were having ear problems. A medical professional was actually on board with them and was able to examine the ear and advise the diver not to dive again that day as she noticed there was some barotrauma there. However, the dive professionals on the boat convinced the diver to dive anyway. Uh, because his neurological check was clear and the diver never denied any pain. This resulted in the diver ended up having a, ru a ruptured eardrum and an ear infection, which prevented the diver from diving for the rest of the trip. So as opposed to just taking a day or two off of diving, the diver now has to set out for the duration until that injury. So as a dive professional, we do have a responsibility to the divers that we're working with, whether they're in our charge or not. And our number one responsibility is the safety of our divers in the water. So divers and um, customers look up to us and our experience to sort of guide them when they're on these charters, live aboards, and dive vacations. And it's our responsibility to give them the, the right advice um, for them to continue to be able to dive safely. They also rely on us for our expertise. So whether they have um, questions about how their gear is set up or what the conditions are like or what the dive's gonna be like that day, it's important for us to be informed and be open and honest with our customers so that everyone can have a good day of diving and everyone is safe. Adversely to that, aside from the pressures from your friends and the dive professionals, there are some self-inflicted pressures. Right. And that brings us to what you do to yourself. So you might be the one that um, is always the last one going into the water, or you might be the one that needs more time to put together their gear. And you might get this feeling of, oh, they're all waiting for me, they're already in the water, or I always use more gas than anyone else, and I'm going to ruin the dive for everyone because we need to cut it short. Or uh, something that has actually happened in one of uh, the last charters I was on that um, someone did not speak up that they had never deployed an, uh, a surface marker before and but didn't want to to hold up the group so they did not know how to deploy a DSMB and that proved uh, very complicated when they actually had to and uh, ended in entanglement. 
So one case that we have for this um, would be, and this is something we see all the time, omitting pre-dive checks. And I cannot say it often enough, those pre-dive checks are what keeps you alive. Um, in this case, diver A geared up for a group dive off a boat. The group was already in the water waiting for him and he skipped his pre-dive check to catch up. Um, he descended to 60 feet and then realized that his regulator stopped working properly right that at that depth he aborted the dive because he couldn't uh, get close to any of his buddies in time and uh, made a rapid ascent to the surface and it was later discovered that his air was only partially um, on so his valve was was mostly closed which is something that we see really really often in the incidents that are reported to us so the takeaway message from that is do not rush it's important not to rush when you're getting prepared for a dive um, it, so to avoid that it's good to develop a routine for your pre-dive checks and stick with it um, don't rush your pre-dive checks your pre-dive buddy checks make sure you go over everything um, avoid distractions when you're checking your gear and when you're checking your buddy's gear. Avoid distractions when you're setting up your gear because um, omitting those checks and forgetting your gear can have dire consequences as we've just seen with that case we just highlighted. Cutting corners is also something we see and we refer to this as a little bit of normalized normalization of deviance. Um, so in this particular case, a rebreather diver was on the surface before the dive had begun took a breath off their rebreather and began to feel dizzy. And then this diver reported taking another breath and thinking, I should probably get back on the boat before waking up <laughs> on the boat uh, to the crew beginning to administer an, um, emergency oxygen. The diver had passed out. So the diver reflects on having issues with his computer connecting to the unit before the trip. And his buddy was the first one to be in the water. They were part of the second group of diving. So the diver also reported feeling like they needed to rush when getting set up. Because they rushed, they omitted their dive checks, did not go through the full checklist, um, did not verify if the solenoid was firing on the rebreather. Their computer ended up not being connected and the diver missed their PO2 levels dropping. Um, so this is another example on why cutting corners and um, rushing through is gonna have dire outcomes. When we find these cases uh, to present to you and we're going through, we see a lot of these being reported, not just to us at Dan, but uh, on social media, um, maybe seeking some sort of advice or trying to get some more expertise and opinions on the matter. But what happens is you get a lot of what I like to call keyboard warriors on social media that are very quick to comment uh, with what you should have done and what you shouldn't have done. And it's easy to shame without knowing the full context because at the end of the day, you weren't there on the dive and there's a lot of things that they're not sharing with us. We only know what the diver is reporting to us. Um, so experience is often mistaken for expertise. So a lot of people that have a lot of numbered dives under their belt might have something to say without the proper training or information to make those types of opinions and calls. Um, so it's always the wrong question to ask is whose fault was it, which is very common on social media. The right question to ask is how can we learn from this incident so it doesn't happen to me. When you're reading these posts on social media, a lot of the times it can make you feel a little bit anxious. And we see that as well with a lot of frequent posts on accident forums or scuba club groups. And then a diver that might have a lot of number of dives under their belt or a lot of experience is starting to feel anxious. Maybe they took a hiatus for some reason and then they booked a liveaboard, but they read about this shark incident or this out of air incident or mass clearing issues or ear issues. And they're starting to think, is this something that's gonna happen to me? Um, that could be a pressure as well. So it's important as a diver to assess your personal comfort level before any dive you embark on um, and define what you're struggling with. Uh, give yourself plenty of opportunity to practice Go diving, find an instructor who understands those struggles or a buddy that you can work with. So if you purchase new gear, try that out before you live aboard. Um, make sure it's configured correctly. Make sure that you're feeling comfortable with your buoyancy, how your equipment works, um, things like that. And that can help you overcome diving. 
There are other pressures involved as well, not just from your peers. Um, it might be financial or economic um, pressures that you might face. For a dive professional, a lot of that comes with needing to work. Um, you might need to go to work that day even though you're burnt out, you're tired, you've been diving for six days straight and somebody called off and you've been called in. Um, that's a pressure that can affect your diving. As a recreational diver, it might be the money spent. You just spent a good chunk of your savings on this live aboard trip. You're so excited for this vacation. Um, you're going to see a new place, a new dive site, or you're going with friends. And that might sway your decision on whether or not you should be diving that day. And then as an operator, you have overhead expenses that you have to account for. So some operators might make the decision that they should take the boat out in bad weather or not ideal conditions um, because it might cost them money if they don't do that. So in this case, we see a case of outside pressures. And unfortunately, it had a really bad outcome. So a diver was spearfishing for income to support their family. Um, and after making two dives that day with their buddies, they said they began to feel dizzy and tired. His friends actually discouraged him from going on another dive, but that pressure of the income he needed from the fish he was going to get, um, he decided to make, a, make the third dive of the day anyway. While on the third dive, they encountered a really strong current, and the diver panicked and pressed on his inflator and made a rapid ascent accidentally. The diver lost consciousness and was transported to the hospital. And when he regained consciousness, he was able to tell his buddies exactly what happened and why he made the decision he did. However, he did end up falling into a coma and later passed away. So this is another example on if you're not feeling okay, um, if others around you are encouraging you to take a step back, to not put so much pressure on yourself um, and not, you know, make smart decisions about when you're going to be diving. And that is exactly what brings us to the culture of dive safety that we, uh, that I said we would be talking about. And a big part of that is psychological safety. So every team member that you have diving with you, whether that is on your boat or in your um, exploration team or just the buddy you just met at the dive site, needs to feel safe to speak up at any point. So what happens is that new divers rarely challenge a more experienced diver because they assume with more dives comes more wisdom, and that is not always the case. Um, and something that I would like to ask all the instructors out there, and I know there are a few of you, um, just ask yourself, is your student ready to be certified? And I know you have pressures, that you have to answer to or the course has been paid for and there's no other dives that need to be done or all skills were done once, um, okay, so I'm just gonna certify, but think about what you do to a diver that is not completely comfortable yet, um, pushing them into this scuba world where um, he might be paired up with a buddy who is equally um, uncomfortable and then might have an issue on a later dive. So just ask yourself, are you doing the right thing and are you certifying people potentially too quickly? And I do know I'm opening a can of worms here with that, but um, I just couldn't let that go. Um, what we want you to do is use that peer pressure that just exists for good. So what you can do to support someone is if a diver has called a dive, for whatever reason, that no one needs to give a reason to call a dive, support that diver. Make sure that they feel accepted in, that, um, in their decision and influence others to do the right thing. So be the role model, be the one, uh, be the buddy that you would ideally want to dive with. And speak up if you witness peer pressure. So if you see that people in your dive club are constantly um, mocking someone else for not going, not pushing the envelope, for not going deeper, for, for not feeling comfortable in lower visibility. Just speak up and say, look, we, we are all different people and we all know different things and just don't be that guy. Absolutely. It's important for those of us that do have more experience under our belt um, to be the role model and the influencer. 
So if you're meeting up with your club on the weekends and you have some newly minted open water divers, it's important that you lead by example. Check your own gear, involve them in the pre-dive checks, involve other people in the pre-dive checks, um, facilitate briefings and debriefings don't just assume that just because that diver is a certified diver that they'll they'll be able or they understand the importance of doing these things a lot of times new divers are just so excited that they might forget something and then if you don't feel up for the dive you can call the dive you can call the dive at any time this is reiterated throughout all of our trainings we say it all the time um, but we rarely see it happen and it's really important that if you do feel uncomfortable you should be able to call the dive. I mean, I've called dives just because I've been in a bad mood. So, you know, it's just something that I didn't want to risk uh, doing that day. Um, so you may call the dive at any time for any reason. But tonight we really want to reiterate to you again that anyone can call the dive for any reason at any time. No, seriously, you can call the dive <laughs> at any reason at any time. <laughs> Um, and use peer pressure, any, any type of pressure to do good, leading by example, making sure that other divers feel comfortable with you, um, that feel comfortable in their diving and help them out. Uh, share your experiences with others and let them learn from certain mistakes. Um, that's what we like to do here at Dan is we, we don't lose, we learn. Um, so presenting your incidents to us or putting them out on social media, it's a chance for us to learn from that opportunity. So those same things don't happen again. Hey, Kat, before you go on here, I'd just like to take a second to remind the audience that we're kind of getting uh, through the presentation a little bit tonight. If you do have those questions, please put them either in the chat box over on YouTube. We are also monitoring the chat on uh, Facebook if you're watching us there, and quite a few people are there. Uh, we see Jamie and Jennifer and uh, Catalina with us tonight, so thanks for, for joining us. But uh, think of any questions you may have and uh, put those in the box. Um. So let's say you are involved in a dive incident and you don't want to share it to social media and you don't want everybody to know that it was you and what happened and all that kind of stuff. That's okay. You can still share it with us here at Dan. We have an incident reporting system. If you go ahead and scan that QR code you see at the top, you can report your incident and share your experiences. Um, our injury monitoring team will read through them. If we have any questions, we might reach back out to you. But when we do present the case, we take out all identifying information. It's completely anonymous, so nobody will know where, when, or who the incident happened to. Um, and if you have any thoughts or comments, you can share that with us here at research at dan.org. And then I would like to draw your attention to two um, call them resources that I found very helpful um, in the past for looking at this culture of dive safety. And uh, one of them is a documentary about a fatal rebreather training dive that was put together by the human diver called If Only. You can see the link here. Um, and it explains how a, a whole set of events led up to this fatal incident and it's very very interesting um, it's about 30 minutes to watch i highly recommend and then another one is the book called, called close calls where leaders in the diving industry have put together experiences that they had and uh, wrote little stories about a dive that could have gone really wrong but they they survived it and lived to to write about it um, and this is, uh, those are really, really fascinating stories and um, I couldn't put the book down at all while I was just reading it through um, from cover to cover. Um, that is another one that I would highly recommend. However, if you have any questions, if you want to report an incident, if you need anything from us here at Dan, that is what we're here for, if you want to reach Kat or myself, uh, research at dan.org for research and injury monitoring. If you have any medical questions, um, shoot an email to medic at dan.org. Training can be reached at oxygen at dan.org and safety services is uh, to be reached at risk mitigation at dan.org. And with that, I would like to invite you to follow us on all our social media channels. Um, we have a lot of resources for you. You can check us out on the website. Um, and if, if there's anything we have not covered, um, just reach out and we will try to get all the information you need to you.
Great presentation, Dr. Uh, Tillman and, and Kat. And I've been looking at the uh, the chat as uh, they've been finishing this up and didn't see anything come through. I saw some some comments, so thank you for uh, for participating. And, and as I said, if you have any questions, you can always reach us here. We have our medical information line available to you during during normal business hours where you reach out. But until then, we'll be here next month. We'll have another webinar in October before the DEMA show. Uh, if you're a professional or business out there watching tonight, we will be at the uh, DEMA show in Orlando, November 1st through 4th. So make sure to come see us either at the booth or uh, at the seminars that uh, we'll have down there. And we'll have a complete schedule available to you uh, soon. That'll be on the stand.org website. But thanks to everyone for joining us tonight. And especially a big thanks, big shout out to our members with your support and help that events like this are even possible. So that's all for us tonight. We'll see you next time.